So again, uh, I know you will see me a lot during these two days. <laughs> I hope it's <laughs> you're not uh, okay. You will not cry at the end. Uh, okay. Uh, so I was introducing some of the things that we would like to be able to compute. Uh, later, I will also say that what we are mostly interested in is how these things behave at large size of a random matrix, so large n. Uh, but first, let me say that these are not the only guys that we can be interested in. There are, so there is also the Z, uh, so I already introduced the partition function Z, but uh, let me also say that there are other very interesting observables, which are typically, uh, well, everything that can depend on eigenvalues, mm -hmm. every symmetric function of eigenvalues, while the traces of powers somehow make a, I mean, generate all the symmetric polynomials of eigenvalues, but that's not the only way. There are other ways. There is, for example, the Schur functions, the Schur polynomials, and there is also determinants. Determinant is also a symmetric function, and something very interesting is typically the determinant of x minus lambda, the characteristic polynomial, so the expectation value of characteristic polynomial uh, is a very interesting quantity, and very often we shall give a name to that and call it psi of x. Uh, and just regarding the things we were discussing a minute ago, yeah, uh, it's, this will be the, so this psi of x will be the, um, the, the flat connection in the group. Okay. Uh, or abelianization of a flat connection. Okay. Uh, there is also the one over determinant of x minus lambda that will be very useful. Let me call it psi tilde of x. Uh, this one has poles on the, on the contours. I mean, it's singular along the contours. This one is uh, regular everywhere except at infinity. Uh, and at the poles of V. Uh, we have more generally expectation values of product of determinant of X mi xi minus lambda to some power alpha i. i equals 1 to, let's say, k. Okay. And there it's convenient, and it's convenient to multiply this by uh, product of i smaller than j of xi minus xj to the power alpha i alpha j. Uh, Regarding the transformation rules, uh, it would be convenient to multiply this one by square root of dx and this one by square root of dx and this one by product of dx i to the alpha i square over two. I mean, it has better properties of how it transforms and under changes of variables. I mean, basically, if you don't do that, when you do a change of variable, you will observe that this will be multiplied by the Jacobian of your change of variable to the power alpha i square over two. Uh, or here, it will be multiplied by the square root of a Jacobian. Okay. Uh, but when you multiply by square root of dx, it is fully invariant under changes of variable. Mm -hmm. So, uh, on the notation for that, I will again use psi, but I will use a divisor notation, uh, alpha 1 x1 plus alpha 2 x2 plus plus alpha n, alpha k, xk. Uh, this is a, just a symbolic notation to remember that we have x1 with exponent alpha 1, x2 with exponent alpha 2, and so on. But this is the notation used. It's called a divisor. A divisor is just a symbolic uh, sum of points weighted by, uh, by, uh, by a weight. And it just, uh, just take it as a notation to, for the left hand side. Okay? But it's very useful to use divisors. Okay, so these are typically the kind of quantities we can be interested in. Uh, in fact, let me give a special name to k of x1, x2, which is in my notation psi of x1 with the coefficient 1 plus minus 1 x2. So we, which is in my notation expectation value of determinant of x1 minus m over determinant 
of x2 minus m uh, times 1 over x1 minus x2 times square root dx1 dx2. If you know algebraic geometry, this is 1 over the prime form. This is the prime form. Well, 1 over the prime form. I mean, the prime form is inverse. The prime form vanishes at x1 equals x2. Uh, OK. So this one is extremely useful, and I will talk about that later. It was just an introduction of what are typically all the quantities that people can be interested in in random matrices. And then I want to introduce another one, uh, which is the empirical density of eigenvalues. So, by the way, all these can be, so when I say observables, it's the word uh, used by physicists, but it's also, uh, it's also uh, random variables. So, uh, typically, traces of power are random variables that take values in C. Resolvent is a random variable that takes values in the space, in a space of functions of one variable. Uh, WNs are random uh, variables that take values in space of uh, several variables, of functions of several variables. Uh, this one also, it it's takes values in a space of spinors and so on. Uh, okay. Uh, but so, what is the, empir the empirical dis density of eigenvalues? Let me write it this way, rho, emp rho empirical of x is sum over i equals 1 to n of delta of x minus lambda i, the delta function, and let me put a 1 over n. Uh, so sorry, let me put an h bar. Okay. Well, later I will take mostly h bar equals 1 over n. So uh, it does not really matter. Uh, so which means it is a measure. So it is a measure on our gamma, on gamma. So let, let's case where let's say we are in the case H n of gamma. It can be generalized to other cases, but it is a measure. So uh, it is a measure on gamma. And so basically, you should cho choose x belongs to gamma. And it is a measure on gamma. Uh, and when you want to compute its expectation value of rho e of x, uh, so let me also call it h bar of trace of delta of x minus lambda. E rho e of x uh, will be just so uh, so it's just uh, so h bar uh, so expectation value of sum of our i equals one to n of delta of x minus lambda i. So it is again a measure. So let me call it m of gamma. And in fact, it's a probability measure. Uh, sorry, it's not a prob. No, OK. Let me replace by 1 over n. So then the mass of this is always 1. So now it's a probability measure. OK. And let me call it rho of x. So it is a certain measure on gamma. And it's called the spectral measure because it, it tells you where the, so it tells you what is the in average, what is the density of eigenvalues of your random matrix. So for a given random matrix, the eigenvalues are discrete, and that's why the empirical measure is a, is a sum of delta. 
but when you take the, the, integral, the, the average of uh, the full ensemble of random matrices, you can end up having uh, a continuous uh, measure that could be continuous with respect to the big measure, and that's typically what you get. Uh, it's much better behaved. Um, so now uh, I'm still in part two, uh, and I don't remember the numbering, but uh, probably something like five. Uh, large n. So what happens in the large n limit? Uh, what happens in the large n limit? Let us start by, uh, by the density of eigenvalues. And uh, let me, in fact, I don't know if I could show some... Uh, Okay, well, I will draw the pictures. Uh, take, uh, well, take the example where v of x equals x squared over 2. So our uh, measure is exponential minus uh, trace minus uh, 1 over 2 h bar trace of m squared uh, dm, 1 over z. Okay. This is our measure, which in terms of eigenvalues gives uh, 1 over z, 1 over n factorial, uh, van der Monde of lambda to the square, product i equals 1 to n of e to the minus 1 over 2 h bar lambda i to the square d lambda i. This is called the Gaussian. Well, this is the Gaussian measure. Okay, and I don't know, you have probably seen that, you have probably heard of, about this semicircle law. When you start taking n large, take, so take n large, but take also h bar tends to zero, and such that n times h bar is uh, O of one. I mean, it tends to a limit. So let's take this limit where n is large, but at the same time, you take h bar small. In fact, you could just take, for example, h bar equals 1 over n. That would, could work. Or, in fact, h bar equals t over n. That would work. In fact, this, this t is often referred to as the toothed parameter. It's when Tooft realized, Tooft got the Nobel Prize, but he realized that this is the good limit to take in, uh, in quantum field theories. Uh, that when, whenever you have something with a large group, a large gauge group, uh, the coupling constant should scale as one over the, the size of a gauge group. Uh, if you want to have uh, an interesting limit, otherwise it becomes a kind of trivial. So basically if your if you're coupling constant scales uh, is too small compared to the gauge group. Uh, I think the, to the size of the gauge group, I think the matrix gets somehow frozen in its, uh, basically all eigenvalues tend to be zero. On the, on the contrary, if it would be too small compared to one over n, uh, the eigenvalues would somehow, uh, the potential could be, would be, basically would not feel the potential. You would see only the, the big measure. So these, these limits are not so interesting. So this is the most interesting limit. And uh, what happens in this limit? So if you take this limit and you really um, sample this law many, many times, and I have a picture here on my laptop with five million uh, samples. Well. Okay, this is, uh, this is the hotels. Okay, so this is a histogram of 5 million samples of uh, matrices of size uh, 40 by 40. Okay. And you see, it looks very much like a semicircle. 
Okay. So what happens? So what happens if you draw this density? So uh, in the limit, you see that basically all your histograms will look like that, exactly a semicircle. But if n is large but not infinite, you have in fact a small exponential tail here. It behaves like an exponential. And here, there are some small fluctuations. And typi the typical distance between two, it's 1 over n. The typical distance between two, I mean, the, the wavelength of those fluctuations is, is 1 over n. Here, it behaves like exponential minus 1 over 4 h bar x squared in the tail. And here, it looks very much like the Airy function of, uh, of x times h bar to the power. Uh, well, OK. It, this, this transition looks very much like the Airy function. Same thing on the right. OK? And somehow, this is what we would like to describe. Uh, we would like to describe, uh, so basically, this is a theorem. Uh, I don't remember who proved it first for the Gaussian measure, but probably it was already proved by Wigner. Uh, but it's, it's a, some old result that this code of x converges to, uh, to um, square root to square root of uh, 4 minus x square, uh, 1 over 2 pi times the characteristic function of the set minus 2, 2. And it converges almost surely. Sorry. The empirical density converges almost surely. And what Wigner proved is that the expectation value converges to that. But now, what we'd like to understand. Uh, oh, sorry. Here in the y axis, you have rho, the density, rho of x. OK, here it's. Here it's x. So x is somehow the location of eigenvalues. So it's the eigenvalues. And rho of x is the probability to have. Uh, so rho of x is the probability in average, is the average probability of, of having an eigenvalue of a given x, at a given x. So rho of x is the, sorry, probability density of having an eigenvalue at position x. Rho of x is the average probability density of having an EV at x. And before taking averages, rho E is the probability of having an eigenvalue at position x, so it means that x must be equal to 1 over lambda i's. Should see in the picture? Sorry? Should the parameter be in the picture? Uh, yes, it should, and I think I choose t equals 1 in this picture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, otherwise, it's just I don't remember, probably it's square root, it's minus 2 square root of t, or something like that. Oh, I don't. Okay. Okay, let's take t equals 1 here. Uh, I have my lectures with the correct n numbers, but this is t equals 1. So it's really the case where h bar equals 1 over n. So maybe you cannot read here, uh, it's exponential minus 1 over 4 h bar x square at the two tails. OK. And so what we would like to understand is, first, what would be this limit for another potential, not Gaussian, not quadratic? What would be this limit? Second thing, uh, 
what are the corrections to the limit. So we, want, we are not only interested in, uh, in the limit, but in the, uh, but in the full 1 over n expansion, or which is the same thing, small h bar expansion. And similar question, so large n, or which is equivalent at small h bar, So, very often it turns, so remember I, I defined W1 of x was a trace of 1 over x minus m, the expectation value, and I multiply by dx. And does it have a limit when n becomes large or h bar equals 1 over n becomes small? Does it have a limit? Well, a trace is a sum of n terms. So it's very likely that it will not have a limit because it scales like n. So it becomes, it's basically, it's, it's linear in n. But now if you divide by n, does it have a limit? And the idea is yes, but in fact, instead of dividing by n, I prefer to multiply by h bar, which is almost the same thing. And so uh, this is a theorem, is that uh, h bar times omega 1 uh, has a limit. So there exists a limit when n goes to infinity in this regime of h bar omega 1 of x. And let me call this function omega 0 1 of x. Uh, the density tells you everything about, x, about moments. And the resolvent also tells you everything about moments, and it's very easy to relate the density uh, on, the, on the resolvent. It's called the Stilchus transform. I will not insist on that, but basically, studying the, the behavior of the density or the behavior of the resolvent, uh, the two are very, very closely related. And I will not uh, say too much, but uh, this is more or less equivalent. So this omega zero one is more or less equivalent to the, well, in this example, uh, in this example, so the Gaussian, and with t equals 1, by the way, uh, this will be, uh, the limit will be uh, 1 half of x minus square root of x2 minus 4. You recognize this square root of x2 minus 4 on this 4 minus x square. In fact, it's better here to write it as 2 pi i, x squared minus 4. Okay. Uh, so the two are very closely related. So there always exists a limit, and it's very closely related to this semicircle shape, and this is, will be general for over of these. Uh, okay. Uh, but now, uh, question. So basically, it means that W1 of x behaves as h bar to the power c. And what are the corrections? What is the next to leaning order? Well, first, is there an h bar expansion? Is there, by chance, a next? So would the next correction be an h bar to the zero to the power zero, then h bar to the power one, then h bar to the power two, then h bar to the power three, and so on? It turns out that for uh, Hermitian matrices, uh, the powers of h bar always go by uh, by, by two. I mean, there is a kind of um, uh, duality when you so basically there is a kind of invariance if you change the sign of h bar analytically. So I will not, uh, so basically the next power would be, would be h bar, and let's call the next term omega 1, 1 of x, plus the next term h3 omega 2, 1 of x, plus and so on, h bar to the 1 minus, sorry, 2g minus 1, uh, omega g1 of x. Sorry. Sorry, I forgot the dx here, by the way, because I said it's a one form. So, is this true? Well, in the Gaussian case, yes. 
Uh, in general, uh, this is not so obvious. Uh, so, uh, on more generally, so it, does it exist such an expansion? Uh, well, um, the answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, I will be uh, I will be slightly more precise in, uh, in a second. So. Uh, For a given V, so the potential on gamma, which has to belong to the homology of uh, e to the minus h bar minus one V of x dx. Well, let me call it h one. Sorry. Okay. Does such an expansion exist? And the answer. Uh, so sometimes yes, sometimes no. Can we characterize a little bit more what I mean by this sometimes yes and sometimes no? So in fact, uh, in fact, the answer is here. It's not only sometimes; it's most often. So most often, in fact, there is no such expansion. In fact, it's because the next term, in fact, the next term could be typically something like minus one to the n uh, times something. Or it could be cos, n, cos n uh, alpha times something, which has no one over n expansion. So and it would be here larger than h bar to be of order so which are typically o of one but they have no one over an expansion so typically this is what happens most of the time uh, however in the gaussian case indeed there is such an expansion uh, and, and also i should say uh, i should say that such an expansion is for a given x So basically, such an expansion can exist if x is in a certain place in the complex plane, and it may not exist in another place in the complex plane. There are Stokes sectors. So it depends where you are in the complex plane. So such an expansion could exist uh, on, on for given x. So the complex plane will be cut into sectors, and such expansions will exist in certain sectors, not in others, and so on. And now let me characterize a little bit more the sometimes yes. In fact, for a given, for a given uh, v of x, in fact, there always exists a good choice of gamma. Uh, there is a... a good gamma. There is always a, g a good gamma. And in fact, this gamma, sometimes it can be called uh, steepest descent uh, path. It can also be called the left shot sim symbol. Uh, which is more or less the same thing. Uh, how do you spell left shots? There is an S, no? Yeah. Sorry, sorry? Yes. F S C H, yeah, left shots symbol. Uh, okay, so there is always, so basically for a given V, there is always one that is good. And I will show you some examples especially with the quartic potential. V of x equals x squared over 2 plus t4 x4 over 4. Um, sorry, t2 
x squared over 2. And so this potential, and let me assume that t4 is positive, but let me not assume that t2 is positive. t2 can be both positive or negative. And in fact, let's consider the case where t2 is negative. So this potential typically on the real axis looks like that. And uh, in fact, if, uh, and remember the, my forbidden sectors in the complex plane, So, uh, so I, I told you that the allowed paths can be, for example, this one or this one or this one. Also, the imaginary axis can be good paths and so on. But it depends on the value. So, uh, how do you know which one is a good path? Well, it depends on the value of T2. For certain values of T2, the, the real axis can be the good path. For other values of T2, it's not the, it could be the imaginary axis that is the good path, or, or something like that. Uh, okay, so, uh, so it will depend on the, the precise values of your parameters. And when your parameters change, so there is a critical value of T2 where you change, and it is a Stokes phenomenon, it is a wall crossing phenomenon, there are many ways to call it, but typically everything changes at this value. And I will illustrate it in a moment. Uh, we, we will do the computation precisely uh, in this lecture. So, but I just wanted to, to, to tell you uh, that, so such an expansion, when it exists, it's very cool because you, we are going to be able to compute all the terms. And this is basically what topological recursion will achieve. It will compute all the terms. But you have to keep in mind that such an expansion does not always exist. Not always. Um, and now we, but so now the idea is let's consider a situation where it exists. And, as I, and what I tell you is that for a given potential, you can always choose your gamma such that it exists. This is really hard to prove, it's hard analysis, but uh, I just ask you to believe me. And in fact, we shall, what we shall do now is that we shall make the hypothesis that we are in a situation where it does exist. And now we want to compute the coefficients. How about the limit theorem? So if, if, if I don't want to look at the whole expansion, but I just, I just want to prove that there exists a limit shape, yeah. uh, then the answer is almost always yes, or there's still? No, I think it's always yes. Okay. Um, uh, well, probably there are some hypotheses on V, but uh, it's quite general. At least for V polynomial, yes, the answer is always. Uh, So you see the first things that could go wrong are at order uh, O of one, but at the order H bar minus one, uh, there is always a limit. So, uh, we shall redo the quartic potential later. So, let us assume that what we have is the following. Uh, omega n of x1, xn uh, behaves when n goes to infinity or h bar goes to zero, uh, h bar n equals t, uh, as sum from g equals zero to infinity of h bar to the two g minus 2 plus n omega g n of x1 xn. Let us assume that such an expansion exists. So first of all, there is several, uh, so in fact, what I said so far was the case n equals 1. Uh, already in the case n equals 2, there is something really non-trivial. You see that for n equals 2, omega 2 of x1 x2, Remember, it was the product of two traces. So you could expect that uh, it behaves like n square. So h bar to the power minus two. But remember that what I call omega two is after I subtract, so I take the cumulant. I subtract the product of two expectation values. So I subtract something also of order n square. 
And it turns out that the result, I uh, hope it will be of power h bar to the 0 omega 0 2 plus h bar square omega 1 2 plus and so on. So it's already a strong, something quite strong that uh, the next ruling order is of order h bar to the power 0. This is not so obvious. Um, but again, what I tell you is that there exists a good path. So for the steepest descent path, this is indeed what happens. And you have to, to trust me. And even for omega 3, which is a product of three traces, you could expect an n, q, n to a cube. But after the subtraction, you will get an n to the power minus 1. So you have lost four orders of, uh, of magnitude, which is a very strong uh, non-trivial requirement. Uh, and, for, and in general, for, uh, for omega n, which would seem to behave like uh, so. So somehow, uh, you would expect for a product of n traces, you could expect something like n to the n, to the power n. But when you take the cumulant, you will take instead, you will, so the cumulant will be of order to my, uh, sorry. Uh, so remember, h bar is 1 over n, so it's 2 minus n. So you have lost uh, 2n minus 2 orders of magnitude. And this is something really non-trivial. But it is true in this problem, and you have to prove it. But now let us assume that we have, so let us take this as an assumption. And another thing is that it will be very, uh, so it's just, uh, it's just a symbolic, it's just a symbol. We shall write omega gn, x1, xn. We shall just represent it as a surface of genus G with x2, xn. Just a picture. It just means this function. Okay, it will just help you remember the formulas. Just a mnemotechnic way. Does it really mean that this omega gn is actually a generating function counting some surfaces of gene g with n boundaries? In fact, yes, it is. But uh, it's, uh, it's another story, and probably other people will talk about that in the lectures. OK. So now the next big part is now we, we shall compute all of them before computing. We must find some equations that will allow to compute them. And these equations are called the loop equations, or sometimes the schwinger dyson equations. And basically, it's just integration by parts in the, in the matrix integral. Very hard to erase these boards. Uh, okay, so it's, I think this is chapter three, loop equations. And let me start with some, uh, so one will be start by an example. So I will just, so, uh, remark, uh, the integral of a total derivative of something that vanishes at the boundary is zero. So let me, uh, let me compute this integral, d uh, lambda 1, d lambda n, d over d lambda i, so let's fix i, uh, belong to 1 n uh, of Vandermonde of lambda to the square product of our j equals 1 to n of e to the minus h bar minus 1 v of lambda j. Uh, okay, and whatever your path was, it could be, uh, let me call it gamma. 
but the importance, so basically, this is zero. Oh, sorry, I, let me multiply by lambda i to the power k. And k, uh, k belongs to uh, a positive integer. So such an integral is zero simply because it's a total derivative. And so when you integrate by part, you get the value of this at the boundaries. But we have precisely chosen the, the, the boundaries of our gammas such that precisely this vanishes at the boundaries. Uh, so this is zero. And let's now take a sum over i equals 1 to n. So let's remove that. And let, let us now uh, exploit, uh, let's uh, massage a little bit this formula. Basically, let us now compute the derivatives inside and see that we are going to find a relationship between moments. So we are going to get relationship between moments. So then we have integral over gamma. Let me call that d lambda. Uh, so first, uh, so sum of i equals 1 to n of k lambda i to the k minus 1. So I will put everything. I will put the measure back in factors. OK. So here we get this term. Uh, let me now take the derivative of that term. So minus uh, h bar, so here the, the parenthesis is there, h bar minus 1 v prime of lambda i times lambda i to the k. Lambda i k to the k came from there, and this is the derivative of that exponential, multiplied by the exponential. And then we have to take the, uh, the logarithmic derivative of the van der Mond. And remember that the van der Mond was product from j, uh, from i. Sorry, let me write it. Uh, j different, uh, j smaller than k, smaller than l of lambda j minus lambda l to the square. OK which I could also write as product from j different from L of e to the uh, log of lambda j minus lambda L, uh, while there is a plus or minus sign in front. Uh, but that, it doesn't matter because I'm going to compute the log derivative of that. Uh, so this is sum over j different from i of 1 over lambda i minus lambda j. And that's it. Times lambda k, lambda i to a k. Do you agree? Let me continue a little bit. Uh, well, this first term, so d lambda, so this is k trace of lambda to the k minus 1, minus h bar minus 1 trace of lambda k v prime of lambda. But this term, let's change it a little bit. We have sum over i equals 1 to n sum over j, uh, did I forgot a factor 2 somewhere? Uh, j different from i, lambda i to the k over lambda i minus lambda j. But up to putting a 1 half in front, let me uh, symmetrize it in this way. Uh, 
right? So somehow I just uh, renamed i j on j i to, to get the other one. But now the thing is that this is the sum from L equals 0 to k minus 1 of uh, lambda i to the L, lambda j to the L k minus 1 minus L, this ratio. It's a polynomial of lambda i on lambda j, and it's equal to that. OK? So. plus sum from L equals 0 to k minus 1, sum from I, different from J. I think I made a mistake with a factor of 2 somewhere. Uh, yes, because when you take the log, no, okay, I forgot the 2 everywhere. I mean, it was the 2 of the Vandermont to the square. Uh, okay. And sum from i different from j, which I will write as sum from i on j independent of uh, lambda i to the L, lambda j to the k minus 1 minus L, minus sum from i equals j if you want. And it will be a lambda i to the power L plus k minus 1, so it's. This is equal to that times the measure. OK? We're almost done. Because this, so this sum here is equal to trace of lambda to the L, trace of lambda to the k minus 1 minus L. And this sum here, sum from i, yes, equals 1 to n. And this one, so here we have sum of L equals 0 to k minus 1, minus. And here, this is no longer dependent on L. And there, uh, the sum from L equals 0 to k minus 1 just gives a k uh, trace of lambda to the k minus 1. So in the end, what do we have? Let's, let me keep that for a moment. So what did we get? We get that the expectation value of k trace of lambda to the k minus 1 minus h bar minus 1 trace of lambda k v prime of lambda plus sum from L equals 0 to k minus 1 of trace of lambda to the L, trace of lambda to the k minus 1 minus L, minus k, trace of lambda to the k minus 1, equals 0. Oh, and just observe, this goes away. This would not go away if we had not taken the Vandermont to the power 2, but with another power, it would not go away. Because here, the coefficient 1 in front of this just came from the derivative of lambda i to the k, whereas the coefficient 1 in front of this was uh, half of this power. So if this power would not be 2, the, this term would not go away. And this is called the beta matrix model. And, and when you work not with Hermitian, but with, let's say, real symmetric, this is what happens. You have, you have something proportional, so you have something beta over 2, where beta was the power, was the power of Vandermont. But I will not insist on that. So here, beta equals 2. So what is the bottom line? The bottom line is that for every k positive, uh, h bar minus 1 expectation value of trace of lambda k v prime of lambda equals sum from L equals 0 to k minus 1 uh, expectation value of trace of lambda to the L, trace of lambda to the L, uh, k minus 1 minus L. 
So we have a relationship between expectation values. And in fact, by taking other things but just a lambda i to the k inside uh, the total derivative, we could get plenty of other such equations. And these are all together, so basically we are going to find a complete set of functions that we can put here to get a kind of maximal set of such relations. And this is what is really called the loop equations. However, before doing that, let me, uh, rem let me remind you that a trace of 1 over x minus lambda can also be written as sum from k equals 0 to infinity of 1 over x to the k plus 1, tr uh, trace of lambda to the k. So let me uh, take this equation and now take a sum over k. So you see that you will, so basically you take this equation, you multiply this equation. So take this equation times one over x to the k plus one on sum over k. So what do you get? You will get what I'm going to write now. Expectation value of trace of one over x minus lambda v prime of lambda equals, and here this sum can be transformed into just expectation value of trace of one over x minus lambda, trace of one over x minus lambda. I'm not totally finished. Uh, sorry, it's h bar minus one here. Uh, I'm not finished. Uh, let me observe that h bar minus one e of trace of, let me write it this way, one over x minus lambda. Let me rewrite the v prime of lambda. So I will make use of the relation, the following very deep relation, v prime of x minus v prime of x minus v prime of lambda. It does not look extraordinary, but it's very, very useful. So the term with v prime of x, I put it in front, v prime of x, trace of one, of, of one over x minus lambda, minus h bar minus one, trace of v prime of x minus v prime of m over x minus m, uh, sorry, x minus lambda, I mean, Uh, expectation value equals expectation value of trace of 1 over x minus lambda, trace of 1 over x minus lambda. Right? Why was this useful? It's because V is a polynomial, V prime is a polynomial, or, or let's say V prime is a rational function also, but it, let me start by V prime polynomial. V prime of X minus V prime of lambda over X minus lambda is a polynomial of X. And the expectation value of a polynomial of X will remain a polynomial of X. And the degree is one less than the degree of V prime. Whereas the for example, the expectation value of trace of one over x minus lambda is something that has, you take the expectation value of something that has n poles, uh, and you take the expectation value where the poles can move, you will get uh, some possibly transcendental function of x. But this one will remain a polynomial of x, whatever you do. So this is why it was useful. So. So now we start to recognize our resolvents. The right hand side here is what I call the W2 hat, because I didn't take the cumulant yet, of xx equals, and in the right hand side you have h bar minus 1 
uh, v prime of x w1 of x minus and let me give this a, a name p1 uh, of x where by definition p1 of x is the expectation value of uh, trace of v prime of x minus v prime of lambda over x minus lambda. Okay. Well, first of all, there is a remark that uh, so so uh, case v of x is a polynomial. Then you see that p1 of x is a polynomial of x and degree of p1 uh, must be equal to degree of v prime minus 1. Uh, And just remark one thing is that w1 of x, v prime of x, w1 of x minus p1 of x, so now I redo this transformation with the other way around, is expectation value of trace of v prime of lambda over x minus lambda. Okay? And you see that at infinity it is O of 1 over x at infinity. So why, do, why am I doing that? <laughs> this is a polynomial. So basically, we are saying that v prime of x, w1 of x, is a polynomial plus O of 1 over x. This can be said in another way. P1 of x is the polynomial part of this expanded at infinity. So P1 of x is V prime of x, W1 of x. Let me call it plus, which means polynomial part of, w, of V prime W1 at infinity. In some sense, it is a projection operator that projects some, uh, a certain set of uh, analytic function of x to, the set, uh, to a set of polynomials. It's a certain projection operator. This plus. And this one would be called the minus part. So let me continue a slightly a little bit more. Let me remind you that w2 hat was equal to w of xx plus w1 of x to a square. So let me write it this way now. w1 of x to a square plus w2 of xx equals h bar minus 1 v prime of x w1 of x minus h bar minus 1 P1 of x. Now this will be our first loop equation. Oh, no, this is what I did not want to realize. Okay. Right. Let me give you directly the most general loop equation that we are going to get. And basically, uh, in the, um, you, you remember uh, if instead of writing, uh, so the measure, so uh, sorry, d lambda, d over d lambda i. So sum over i equals 1 to n uh, of, here I remember I put lambda i to the 
k. Uh, let me call it now k1. And now trace of lambda to the k2, trace of lambda to the k3, and so on, trace of lambda to the kn. times Vendermont of lambda to the square, exponential minus one. Okay, if now you play with this one, you will find other equations. And again, you will put now, and then you mul will multiply by one over x1 to the k1 plus one, one over x2 to the k2 plus one, one over xn to the kn plus one, on sum, on sum over k1, kn. Okay, you will get some relationship about uh, expectation values of resolvance. And let me write the most general relationship that you are going to get, which is W hat n of x1 xn equals v prime of x1 w hat sorry n plus 1 n plus 1 x1 x1 is repeated x2 xn uh, plus sum from j equals 2 to n d over dxj of w hat n of x1 xj is suppressed xn over x1 minus xj uh, equals v prime of x1 so h bar minus 1 wn of x1 xn minus h bar minus 1 pn of x1 xn where pn of x1 xn is the polynomial part polynomial part in the variable x1. And I hope, uh, sorry, I think, uh, sorry, this is, sorry, in the numerator here, I have minus wn hat of x2 xn. So now, I mean, the other term is x1, which is excluded, and not xj. And so now it has a, it has a limit when x1 equals xj. So this is the most general loop equations. So this is a theorem, loop equations. So you see the way to prove them uh, in this uh, eigenvalues setting is just write that the total derivative, the integral of a total derivative is zero. This is also what usually people call the integration by parts. There is another way to formulate it, which is called schwinger dyson equations, but this is, uh, this is really the same. Okay. And now we shall work on the solutions to loop equations in the asymptotic expansion. Sorry, uh, there are hats everywhere. And if you want to go to the cumulants, we just have to expand that on cumulants. And in fact, maybe I should show the equation for cumulants. Uh, 
Okay, let me start by doing the solution of loop equations. So two solving loop equations in the asymptotic expansion. It's called the topological expansion. So assuming that Wn behaves like sum over G of H bar to the 2G minus 2 plus N Wgn. It's called topological expansion. As you see, this 2G minus 2 plus N, it's a kind of Euler characteristic. And the picture I used to represent things, it's, it's 2G minus 2 plus N was indeed the minus of Euler characteristic. Right. Uh, so, so, case n equals 1 and uh, leading order in h bar. So first, in the case n equals 1, I told you that our relation was W2 of xx uh, equals v prime of x, W1 of x, minus h bar minus 1, p1 of x. And remember that P1 is V prime W1 plus. Now we shall, sorry, this is W hat, and W hat is also W2, so it's W1 of x to the square plus W2 of xx equals h bar minus 1 V prime of x W1 of x minus h bar minus 1, p1 of x. Now let's write that w1 is equal to h bar minus 1, w0, 1, plus h bar, w1, 1, plus, well, let me, o of h bar cube. Let me write that w2 is h bar to the power of 0, w0, 2, plus h bar square, w1, 2, plus O of h bar 4. And by the way, P1, P1, basically, we just multiply by V prime, which is independent of h bar, and we make act a linear operator, which is also independent of h bar. So P1 will have a similar expansion to W1, so H bar minus 1, w, P1, P0, 1, plus H bar P1, 1, plus O of H bar cube. Let's put all this in the equation. And you see that the leading term is the one with H bar to the power minus 2. For example, W1 square has an H bar to the power minus 2. And h bar times h bar inverse times w1 is also of order h bar to the power minus 2. But this term is of order h bar to the power 0. So you don't see it's two linear order. So two linear order, you get that h bar to the power minus 2 w0, 1 of x to the square equals, uh, so I mean, let me just write the coefficient, v prime of x w0, 1 of x minus p0, 1 of x. We could go to the next order, and I will already write the equation for the next order. The next order is 2 w0, 1 of x, w1, 1 of x, plus w0, 2 of x, x equals v prime of x, W11 of x minus P11 of x, and so on. And in general, uh, sum from h equals 0 to g of W uh, h1 x W g minus h 
of uh, 1 x plus w g minus 1 2 of x x equals v prime of x w g 1 of x minus p g 1 of x for every g uh, larger than 1. Well, you see this equation before taking the expansion, before the expansion, this equation where W1 is an unknown function that you want to compute, but W2 is also an unknown function. P1 is an unknown function, but it is closely related to W1. So you can think that P1 is not so much in part of W1, but you have three unknown functions in this equation, W1, W2, and P1. Well, W1 and P1 are related by this, uh, but W2, uh, so basically, can you use this equation to determine W1 and W2? No, because you have one equation and two unknowns. But if you use this as assumption about the expansion, you see that to leading order, the leading, in the leading order for W1, W2 has disappeared. So now you have an equation And observe that in W01, this equation is of degree 2. And in X, this is also a polynomial equation because V prime of X is, uh, is a polynomial of X. And P01, we don't know it, but it is a polynomial of X. So this equation is, in fact, algebraic. And this is our spectral curve, by the way. So let's solve this equation. Uh, what I mean by solve, we will. So let me give you the, so the solution of this equation is very simple. W01 of x is one half. So I am solving the degree two equation, v prime of x minus square root of v prime of x to the square minus four p01 of x. Okay, kind of trivial, except that we don't know p01. We just know that P01, P01 of x, uh, the degree is the degree of V prime minus 1. In fact, let me, uh, let me recall, uh, let me recall uh, some, um, so let's do an so example. Uh, quadratic v of x equals x squared over 2. Uh, and remember, this is what I call the Gaussian model. Okay. Uh, well, we know that w1 of x, uh, which is trace expectation value of trace of 1 over x minus m uh, behaves like uh, so n over x plus expectation value of trace of m to the x square plus expectation value of trace of m square to the x cube plus and so on at infinity. So V prime of X, W1 of X uh, will behave like N plus O of 1 over X. So which means that P1 of X is just N. So in this case, we can compute it. And, uh, and we can write it as sum from G equals zero to infinity of H bar to the uh, 2g minus 1 pg1 of x. And it's easy to see that. Uh, uh, so and remember that n was t over h bar. So which means that basically t0, p01 equals t and all the pg1 equals 0 if uh, g different from 0. 
So basically, in that case, we know PG1, and we, in fact, we know all PG1s. In fact, in that case, we know everything. So what? What is? It? Well, so this is a really good case because then P01 is not unknown; it's totally known. So W equals one half of x minus square root of x square minus four t. So indeed, the edge was two square root of t. In the complex plane, this is a function which is analytic everywhere except on the interval between minus 2 square root of t and 2 square root of t. It has a cut on this interval. Everywhere else, it is analytic. Well, when I say it's analytic, it means that somehow I have chosen one sign of the square root. So this function you can think that it is analytic on the complex plane except on this interval, and provided that you have chosen one sign of a square root. Uh, but it's possible to, con to analytically continue by making a Riemann surface by gluing two copies of this plane corresponding to the two signs of a square root. You glue them together along the cut, so which means that when you go from the cut and you want to continue, you have to go to the other sheet. So let's make, uh, so you have your first copy of a plane and the second copy of a plane. And the gluing rule is the following. Whenever you approach the cut from above, you analytically continue uh, on the other side. You see that if you go twice around the cut, you come back to the initial sheet because there are exactly two signs of the square root. So in fact, now, instead of thinking of this function as analytic with a cut on the complex plane, it's much better to think of it as completely analytic everywhere on this Riemann surface. So it's much more convenient to think that it is uh, analytic everywhere on this Riemann surface. On this Riemann surface, the square root is, not, uh, is, is analytic. Let's do the same thing for the quartic potential. And well, the density associated to resolvent is the, basically it's the discontinuity of a resolvent on the cut. And so the density will be the semicircle law associated to that one, uh, divided by 2 pi i. It's the discontinuity divided by 2 pi i, so this is why we had, the, uh, we had this formula before. So basically the rho, rho uh, 0, 1 of x would be 1 over uh, 4 pi i, no, 2 pi i. Um, square root of 4t minus x square. Sorry, 4 pi. Uh, well, the density normally you divide by n, and here I multiply by h bar, so there is a t in the ratio, so it's probably 4 pi t, I think. Okay, I let you make sure that this density has a total mass 1. And if you don't make a mistake, the total mass must be 1. Uh, and it looks like a semicircle. Right. Now, now uh, let's, let's do the quartic potential. So my other example, quartic. So v of x is uh, t2 over 2x squared plus t4 over 4x4. 
So V prime of x is T2 x plus T4 x cube. Rem remember that, so let me do the same, almost the same computation this year. W1 of x is n over x plus expectation value. Sorry, I, I wrote m, but I meant everywhere I meant lambda. Well, remember that lambda was the eigenvalues of m, but so it, it does not make any difference if we take traces. Uh, tra so expectation value of trace of lambda over x square plus expectation value of trace of lambda square over x cube plus and so on, which means if, if you look carefully that p1 of x must be, so you multiply this by v prime of x and you take everything that has positive powers of x. So we have t4 times n x square plus t2n. Uh, oh, okay. Um, let me assume that our gamma is the real axis. And t4 was positive. Okay. Uh, well, you see that the potential here is even. Gamma is... Uh, is stable under symmetry x to minus x. So you can expect that every odd expectation value is going to be zero. It would not be true if we had chosen gamma to be a non-symmetric contour. But here, I want to work in the simplest situation, so I don't want to have to demonstrate that expectation value of trace of lambda is zero. Let's let's assume it by simple symmetry argument. So plus, and here, T4 expectation value of trace of lambda square. Uh, yes, that's it. So it's a degree two polynomial and it is even. It is even because I have chosen everything even in the story. So this term is unknown, but it does not depend on x. That's what really matters for us. So what is, and so, so when you, so this implies that, uh, sorry, not this, but this implies that uh, P zero one of x would be, so remember that h bar n is t, t4 t x square plus t2 t plus uh, t4 uh, h bar expectation value. So plus, well, plus a certain quantity. Uh, let me call it, uh, okay. Let me say that this is going to be sum of g equals zero to uh, infinity of h bar to the 2g minus one. Uh, let me give the name, I don't know, cg1. cg1 is just a number, okay? Plus t4 t c01 whatever this number C01 is, basically we shall have to compute it. Okay, so then what is our formula? W01 of x is one half of T2x plus T4x cube minus, uh, minus square root of some polynomial, which is uh, of degree six, T4, well, okay. Let me write it, V prime of X to the square minus four P zero one of X. And this polynomial has degree six. So 
So let's draw in the complex plane. Well, let me again draw my forbidden sectors. And let me say that my integration contour was the real axis. And let me say that gamma 1 and gamma 2. Uh, OK. Are not populated. So n1 equals 0, n2 equals 0. And here I have 2 power n, this one. Well, this function is analytic everywhere except at the six zeros of this polynomial inside the square root. So there are six points where uh, you could have a cut. And typically, uh, okay, let me draw a kind of realistic situation. Uh, let me try to do a realistic situation. One of the zeros. Uh, so first, this polynomial is even. So it's invariant under x and minus x. And uh, let, let me say, say that there is a pair of zero there and a pair of zero there. Let's say if, if C01 is kind of nearly generic, well, we know that it is real. Uh, on positive, yes, it's the expectation of trace of lambda square on lambda is real, so uh, it's going to be a positive real number, but we don't know what it is, and typically, let me say that it could look like that. And now this is where it is important to remember this condition that I wrote before, is that for every integration contour gamma prime that is not supposed to contain eigenvalues, you should get zero if gamma prime does not basically does not enclose gamma. For example, if I take this gamma prime, so I have six, so sorry, uh, let me first say that you have six branch points where you can have cuts, and let's choose the cuts to be like that, like that, and like that. And so W1, W01 is analytic outside of these four uh, red paths. But now, take gamma prime to be this contour. we knew from the beginning that this has to be true. Imagine that, uh, that indeed the value of C01 that, that you have chosen is such that there really is a cut there. So basically these two points are not uh, at the same point. Imagine that they are not, um, they are not distinct. If they are not distinct, you can compute the contour integral of this, and you will see that it is not zero. The only way to have this property here is to take these two points uh, not distinct, is to say that these two points must be equal. And basically, there is only one value of C01 that will correspond to it. So, the filling fraction condition. And here, in this example, well, of course, by parity, if these two are the same, then these two are also automatically the same. So this polynomial of degree six, which generically had six simple zeros, in fact, C01 must be chosen such that, in fact, it has two simple zeros and two double zeros. And so, so here, here, 
C01 must be such that the prime of x to the square minus 4p01 of x has two simple zeros and two uh, double zeros. So let me write it in this way. Well, first, the leading order coefficient was a t4 to the square, t4 to the square times. And here you want to have, uh, so the two simple zeros, let me write them x minus a, x minus b. But b, by parity, it must be x plus a times. Uh, and let me give a name to this uh, place here. Let me call it x minus c to the square, and there will be also x plus c to the square. Well, let me even call it x minus ic and x plus ic. c is just the, the locus now of the degenerate, so ic on minus ic. And this is a on minus a. And this must be equal to t4 x6 plus 2 t2 t4 x4 plus t2 square x square minus 4 t4 t x square minus 4 t2 t minus 4 t4 t c01. Well, uh, there are many ways to say that it, can have, it must have a double zero. So there, there is something called the, well, the discriminant is the condition that a polynomial has a double zero. So basically, that the resultant between a polynomial and its derivative is zero. Uh, there are many ways. But basically, this equation will give you, at the same time, C01, A, and C. I let you do this computation. It's an interesting computation to have done once in your life. However, there is a shortcut. There is a, a way to avoid this computation. But let me rewrite the How much time left? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, okay. Let me first, let me write first that W01 of x, in that case, is one half of V prime of x minus uh, T4, T4 times x square plus C square times square root of x square minus A square. Okay. So now we have only a square root. So because there are double zeros, I could put them out of a square root. And now we have a square root of a degree two polynomial. And it is known in algebraic geometry that this is a genus zero curve. OK? Uh, or, yeah. And, and there is also a theorem saying that every genus zero curve is, uh, is isomorphic to the Riemann sphere, so to the complex plane. And, uh, and let's exhibit this isomorphism in this case. So remember, our Riemann surface is a Riemann surface where we have this cut minus a, a, and we have our IC here, and minus a, a, that are glued, so it's two copies of a complex plane, and that's where the variable x lives. OK, I, want, I will make a bijection to another thing, which is just the complex plane itself. 
And I will call the variables here z. And the relationship, so the, relation, the, the change of variable between x and z is called the Zhukovsky uh, transformation. And let me write it gamma. OK, uh, here the parameter is called gamma. It's an habit that has been taken for a long time, but it has nothing to do with the, with the path. Here, it's really, uh, gamma is just a complex number. But OK, it's, it's, it's also called very often the capacity in, uh, in, in physics. Uh, well, um, OK. And uh, W01, let me call it Y, by the way. And Y will take this very simple formula, T over gamma Z plus, uh, plus T4 gamma cube over z cube. Uh, am I right? Yes. So instead of using, so or if you want, gamma z will be one of, uh, of uh, x minus square root of uh, x square minus 4 gamma square, and I think it's 2 gamma. So I mean, this is the reciprocal transformation. So finding x from z or finding z from x, and you have two possible signs that correspond to the two sheets. And now you plug that here. And you will find that. Uh, how are you sure that this is the correct formula? <laughs> uh, you see, I didn't make any computation. Well, you still have to compute gamma. And to compute gamma, you will, uh, and, and the equation I will tell you is very simply t over gamma is gamma plus 3 t4 gamma cube. OK. How do I see it immediately <laughs> without looking at my notes? Uh, OK. So instead of solving this equation, I can write that directly. Uh, well, and so, but I, I just prefer to explain a little bit. So let me draw the unit circle, the point 0, the point minus 1, and the point 1. And let me do symbolically say that the point at infinity is there. Uh, and here, the, in this mapping, you have to think that in this mapping, all the outside of the unit circle is mapped to the first sheet, and the inside of the unit circle will be mapped to the second sheet. Zhukovsky invented this conformal mapping uh, because he wanted, uh, he was working on the, he was an engineer working on the hydrodynamics of wings. Uh, and and uh, the wings typically are like segments. But the equations are in, of hydrodynamics are invariant under conformal transformations, but they are difficult to solve with segments. They are very easy to solve with a circular wing. So that's why he did that. Um, so when he realized that this transforms a segment into a circle, it, was, uh, it made everything much easier. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so how is this the good solution? Remark that there are two values of z at which x is infinite. Zero, uh, infini z equals infinity and z equals zero. Indeed, in our Roman surface, we have two points at infinity, uh, one in the first sheet, one in the second sheet. So basically, you should look for a rational transformation uh, that, uh, that has the good number of poles. And this one has the good number of poles. You can see, well, since it's just, Z is just a kind of dummy variable, uh, it's just a parameterizing variable. You could do a Möbius transformation on Z. But it's convenient to choose one of the poles to be at zero, the other one to be at infinity. It's very convenient. Uh, also, um, 
By the way, gamma uh, is related to our uh, A here, while the A is just worth two gamma. So it's the image of the points minus one on minus one on one are sent to two gamma. And this is the place, so one on minus one are the place where the derivative of x vanishes, the differential of x. So if you want dx is gamma, one minus one over z squared dz, and it vanishes precisely at z equals one on minus one. These are the branch points. Okay, now, why did I choose this expression for one the sign of a square root? Instead of compensating, somehow it doubles uh, the poles. So, so this one at infinity here, w0, one of x in the other sheet, should, should on the contrary behave like v prime of x, twice one half of v prime. So in the other sheet, you, so it means that in the other sheet, there is a pole, double y has a pole at this infinity, so which means a pole at zero. And this is a pole of degree three, because v prime was of degree three. To leaning order, it behaves like e four x to the cube, which is t four gamma cube z to the minus three, because at infinity, x behaves like gamma times one over z, which is the leaning one. So this is why we have this term. This has a pole of degree three of the right order. Okay. Now to see uh, why I get this term here, this term is on the contrary, it's in the first sheet that it behaves like e over x. And I will, okay. You, you can play a little bit, but uh, now if you insert also this value of z in this equation, uh, sorry, here I should have put a plus on the other, so on inside you, you take the minus. Code. So if you, basically if I put a minus, it means it's one over z. One over z is the same expression with a minus. So take this, put it here, uh, and write everything in terms of square roots, and you will get that. Uh, so this is uh, an exercise that is useful to do. Uh, and okay, uh, I will give you the general framework for that. But uh, what to retain is that whenever the spectral curve has genus zero, you can always find a rational parametrization. And working with a par rational parametrization will make all your life easier. The, every computation will be much simpler than solving trying to find a condition on C01 such that there is a double zero and so on, uh, it will make your life definitely easier. And you should always use that. Uh, and this equation uh, is the constraint, but the behavior, uh, the, the, the x to the power one term was correct here. And you, you get this equation when you try to give, uh, and basically it gives you gamma. And once you know gamma, you know everything else. And I will give you uh, this afternoon the, the precise values of uh, VC01 and everything. I can read my notes. Uh, maybe I should stop there? Okay. So just to conclude, we have found the spectral curve. In this very specific example, where we assumed parity, uh, so this would not work at all if we choose gamma one. But in this case, we have a genus zero spectral curve. If we start putting eigenvalues on the three paths, we can have a genus up to three spectral curve. We could have a genus three spectral curve. But I just wanted to show you the simplest of all possible cases where it's genus zero. And then we shall continue. And the goal next then is we will be to complete every WGN. I agree. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay.
j just can I just ask a question? Who has ever done random matrices here from little or even little? Almost, uh, well, some people have never seen that. So. <laughs> And some are really experts, I know. But, uh, Can you see the how, how the data <laughs> This is what I explained this, in the first lecture this morning. Every time you have a contour that does not enclose the integration contour of eigenvalues, uh, Basically, for each instance of, of the matrix, this holds. So this holds in average as well. So what I said is that if now you know that W01 must take that shape with a square root of a degree 6 polynomial, typically, if you don't know where is, what is C, the value of C01, you would have, uh, what, you would have 6 zeros. This polynomial would have six zeros, and typically you would have one cut there, one cut there, and one cut there. Now you know that gamma prime, so uh, that if you take a gamma prime that does not enclose the real axis, because we started with the real axis, if you take a gamma prime that does not enclose the real axis, this equation must hold. And in particular, it must hold order by order in h bar. And so it means that the integral of omega 0, 1 on gamma prime should be 0. And this is possible only if this cut collapses. That's the idea. But of course, as soon as you start using another contour, you don't, allow, you don't take the symmetry or things like that, then indeed the genus could be 3. The configuration that is basically in the lunch, you have the we're assuming an hour and a half. So. Mm -hmm. 